one. Election 2024, not at the ballot box, but in the courtroom. Donald Trump sues George Stephanopoulos and ABC for defamation. The quote-unquote hush money trial in New York delayed until April. But today is the deadline for a $454 million bond for Donald Trump. Two, a one-man play by a fascinating actor on one of the most fascinating minds of the 20th and 21st century. A hero, Thomas Sowell. And three, the courtroom. What a fascinating little window into the minds of how we make up our decisions as individuals, as a group, and as a society. What can we learn from inside a jury box? It is the Will Kane Show, streaming live at foxnews.com on the Fox News YouTube channel, on the Fox News Facebook page, and always on demand in audio format, if you like listening to podcasts, at Apple, Spotify, or at Fox News Podcast. Just go hit subscribe. And always on demand in video form on YouTube. The Will Kane Show. Right under this live stream, if you just expand the description, there's a little button you just have to hit subscribe. And you will always get shorts, exclusive interviews, or the show in full. Just subscribe to The Will Kane Show. I have a tendency to think thematically. I have a tendency to think, what ties this together? I like to look deep, but I like to understand, and I like to see what currents run consistently across what we do as individuals or how we behave as groups. I think I'm not forcing it to say that is the theme of today's Will Cain show. It is a big day for Donald Trump. There are various ways this $454 million bond could be satisfied, but none of those are really good outcomes for Donald Trump. Well, not good outcomes except in any arena except the arena of politics. And unfortunately, in 2024, politics is playing out in the courtroom. And that takes us to our theme for today, the courtroom. I have a little bit later in the show coming up one of my lifelong friends, and he is one of the best trial attorneys in my humble estimation in America. He specializes, and when I say specializes, I mean, he almost exclusively works in the courtroom, which that doesn't happen really anymore with attorneys. And I think that was on full display in Georgia when it came to Fannie Willis and even the defense lawyers for the various friends of Donald Trump. They just weren't very good. They don't understand how to cross-examine. They don't know how to think logically. But then on top of that, they don't have the humility to understand that wisdom is more important than logic. In other words, how do people make decisions? If you lock 12 people in a room, how do they come to a consensus? It's a scary proposition, but it's one you should understand. I mean, if you're ever on a jury or, God forbid, your life is ever in the hands of a jury. So my friend Dave Sugden, an attorney with Call Jensen, will come up a little bit later in the show, and I think it will tie into what's happening with Donald Trump, but also what's happening in our personal life. How do we use or how are we susceptible to persuasion? Do we make decisions logically or do we make decisions emotionally? Do we make decisions individually or do we make them as part of a herd? That's coming up a little bit later in the Will Cain Show. But again, maybe I'm forcing the theme because I think thematically. But I'm into the wisdom and the folly of crowds. And I had a great weekend. I had a really good weekend. This is despite the fact that I had insomnia on Friday night, which left me with four hours of sleep before Fox and Friends on Saturday morning. And the most frustrating thing about his insomnia is there's no ever answer to the why. Why can't I fall asleep? You know, did I not take the right vitamins? Did I not eat right? Am I stressed out? Is it just physical? Why can't I fall asleep? And then it builds on itself and it cycles into this horrific insomnia. And then that was doubled down on Saturday night because I stayed up to watch Texas lose to Tennessee in the NCAA tournament. So that's two nights in a row of four to five hours sleep. But it didn't get in the way of an awesome weekend. First of all, one of the benefits of having this career is I get to meet a lot of quote-unquote celebrities. And I've long since let go of being, you know, impressed by unearned celebrity. I, I don't get I don't get fanboyed out. I don't have stars in my eyes. And I've met a lot of my 
quote unquote heroes. You know, I've met Troy Aikman, I've met Tony Romo, I've met every stripe of politician, but I rarely anymore fanboy. I did on Saturday. I met Cody Jinx, absolutely one of my favorite country music artists who was on Fox and Friends on Saturday. I'll talk a lot about that more tomorrow here on the Will Kane Show, but it was awesome. And I'm working on becoming best friends with Cody Jinx. We both like to duck hunt. We both like Ayn Rand. We both like the same area of Texas. I I think we are we are like stepbrothers. We are new best friends. Me and Cody Jinx. But I had a great weekend because when I got back home to Dallas on Sunday night, my wife, my two sons, and the entirety of my oldest son's soccer team went to AT&T Stadium to watch the Nations League final, the CONCACAF Nations League final of the United States versus Mexico. As a side note, AT&T Stadium holds up. I told you I went to the Super Bowl. I saw the brand new sparkling stadium in Las Vegas. It's got nothing on AT&T. It's got nothing on the Cowboys. And that's not blue and silver shaded goggles. Man, that stadium just is awesome, even when it's under renovation. And we had seats right up in the corner, like front row right up in the corner. Here's what I want to talk to you about the wisdom and the folly of crowds, forcing my theme into a soccer match between the U.S. and Mexico. So the Mexicans are rowdy. They're very rowdy. Okay, we were outnumbered Americans, and I knew it would be the case at a game in Dallas. I knew it would be the case. It would be the case in Southern California. Hell, I've been to a U.S.-Mexico game in New York, and you're at best 50-50 in New York. In Dallas, it's 70-30. A lot of green, a lot of Mexico in the stadium. Now, I've been to a couple U.S.-Mexico games, and you learn a couple of things. First of all, Mexicans like to have a good time. All right, They're there for some fun. They're there early, and they stay late. And they chant, and there's an enthusiasm and a passion where when in their national anthem, when we do our national anthem, it's more reverence and solemnity. There, it's almost a party during the national anthem. And they're cheering throughout the game. At one point, Christian Pulisic, America's best player, is right in front of us taking a corner kick. And Mexico guy, fan, decked out in green, he chunks an entire beer right down on top of Christian Pulisic, who wasn't phased, didn't even turn to the crowd, just took his corner kick, which means, look, he's been here before, man. This ain't my first rodeo. My wife, though, first rodeo, I mean, Cowboys games, Mavericks games, Longhorn games, Texas Tech Red Raider games, which can be rowdy with some tortillas flying. My wife's like, I have never seen anything like that. And I said, honestly, I don't know that I've seen that either, like just dumping a beer on a player now that dude from that Mexican fan was booted he was booted from the stadium once everybody started pointing here's your guy here's your guy security came and got him but it was rowdy at the end of the game U.S. won two nothing U.S. celebrates in the corner and bottles are flying which I don't know how that happens because in anticipation of this they didn't let when you go buy a beer or even a Dr. Pepper they don't give you the bottle they pour it out into you know a solo cup for you because they know Bottles are projectiles. So the U.S. team, though, showered with bottles. And in the stands, fights. I saw a picture this I saw some fights, but I saw a picture this morning on the Internet of a guy just showered in blood. He said, I don't know if I was hit by a bottle, beer can. Again, they don't let you have a beer can or a battery. But, look, the Mexico crowd, rough. And that, that, that's got to, you know, we got to get that tightened up. We got to get that tightened up. Now, are we ever going to get that tightened up? Because this is this is this is the way they roll in Mexico, and one of the ways they roll is chanting a derogatory term at the opposing players. There's one in particular, and I don't know if I can use it here on the Will Kane Show. It's in Spanish, but it basically translates into a homophobic slur. You pick up what I'm putting down. I thought it translated into, you know, a female dog, but it it, it translates more into, you know, a target that is we would translate into English, you know, uh, at homosexuals. But the the I don't know the intention of the crowd because that's the point. It's a crowd. And this chant, it's not like a single or a couple groups of guys and you can boot them out. It's 50,000 people chanting it at the same time. Normally, when 
the opposing goalkeeper, in our case, a guy named Matt Turner, takes a goal kick, and you can see a goal kick coming. You know, he has a wind-up, and then it's, uh... And then when he kicks the ball, they all yell, in unison, this slur. And absolutely nobody in the stadium is offended. Not Matt Turner, not America. But FIFA and CONCACAF, which is the regional governing body of soccer, have made it so that every time that happens now, a big warning comes up on the Jumbotron, both written and spoken aloud in English and in Spanish, and the game stops. Discriminatory behavior will not be tolerated, yada, yada, yada. And the crowd is only provoked to do it more. They laugh, they boo at the corrective mechanism of Big Brother over the PA system, and then the next time the opportunity presents itself, another goal kick, boom, there they are again. Uh, And then they all, 50,000, yell this one particular word. And all it made me think about is, first of all, everybody in the stands like, this is so stupid. Not the chant, and yeah, the the chant you could say is juvenile and stupid, or if you want to say it's, you know, discriminatory, which, by the way, I don't know that 50,000 people have a homophobic thought in their mind. What they have in their mind is trash talk, is trying to get in somebody else's head. What they're trying to get is revenge for losing to nothing. But they're not going to listen to an overhead announcement. They're not going to obey Big Brother. And everyone in the crowd thinks this is so stupid. They stop the game for like five-minute periods at a time. They give this announcement. I bet we heard the announcement at least half a dozen times. And it just made me think about society and, you know, sheep versus wolves and how you control behavior and the theme of the day. Like how do you talk to people and try to persuade? Because the answer is not, I promise you, it is not Big Brother. I saw on the internet today, ban Mexico, ban fans. At some point, forget what not, this is not an endorsement of certain words spoken. By the way, 60 Minutes last night, full-on investigative piece, basically staking out their claim they are anti-free speech. It's just insane the climate of, that we live in of antagonism to free speech. The way that you're going to persuade, incentivize, and lead people is not through censorship and hectoring in Big Brother. I just encourage you, go to a U.S.-Mexico game and ask if your heavy-handed approach is working. You can't control the minds or the mouths of 50,000 people. I think that's an interesting window into what's really happening across social media, across America, across the world, is basically the world is yelling, either from a PA system at a soccer game or from Washington, D.C., shut up and fall in line. And even if the crowd is wrong, because crowds aren't just full of wisdom, crowds are full of folly. Even if the crowd is wrong, ask yourself, are you actually leading that crowd to a better place? Are you persuading? Or might you think of something else than the Iron Fist? That was my weekend. It was awesome, once again, to hang out with the boys and the wife and the teammates and the dads and to see America, USA, win 2 nothing, USA. Let's get into it a little deeper today about not just how we persuade, how we incentivize, how we talk to one another as individuals and groups in society, but how it affects the courtroom and then ultimately how it affects Donald Trump. Let's start with story number one. Donald Trump and his attorneys are suing ABC, Disney, and George Stephanopoulos for defamation. This could have landed off of your radar, as there are cases all across this nation and all across the dockets against Donald Trump. But this one is Trump on offense, and it's not the first time he sued a major media organization for defamation. This time, though, he's suing George Stephanopoulos. He's suing ABC. He's suing our parent company, Disney, because... A few weeks ago, on This Week with George Stephanopoulos, in an interview with Nancy Mace, something like 10 times, Stephanopoulos said that Trump was guilty of rape. Here, listen to the way this went down on ABC. 
it's actually not about shaming you. It's a question about no, Donald Trump. No, you are shaming me. You've you. endorsed Donald Trump for president. Right. Donald Trump has been found liable for rape by a jury. Donald Trump has been found liable for defaming the victim of that rape by a jury. It's been affirmed by a judge. It was not a criminal the, court case, was, number one. Number two, I live with shame. And you're asking me a question about my political choices, trying to shame me as a rape victim. And I find it disgusting. Nancy May is turning the tables of victimization there on George Stephanopoulos. But what Jeff Stephanopoulos had to say is false. It's not true. The beginning of a claim for defamation. Donald Trump was not found liable for rape. If you look back at that case and you see the jury's findings, he was explicitly, explicitly not found guilty of rape. Given the options, check yes or no, they checked no on that. Now, he was found liable of sexual assault. You can say that's semantics or that's a gray area, but not when the two options are presented to a jury. And certainly the word sexual assault carries a different connotation in the public's mind than the word rape. And that's the point on defamation. Are you harming someone else's character? Stephanopoulos surely knew the truth, yet he continued over, like I said, 10 to 12 times to use the falsehood. Now, maybe Donald Trump is... is you know, defamation proof. He's such a public figure, surrounded by so many lies that you can't ever win a case for defamation. But this should be an obvious case. Here are the legal elements. First of all, is it false? When you are a public figure, you have a heightened standard. The speaker must be proven either to have a reckless disregard for the truth or actual malice. Those are the terms. Reckless disregard for the truth or actual malice. I mean, you're trying to harm someone by perpetuating a known untruth. I would think that right there would satisfy the elements of, at the very least, a reckless disregard for the truth, at the most, and necessary, actual malice. Now, once again, what happens in real life and the way it should work is different than the way it does work, both in people's minds and in the court. And again, that's the theme today for The Will Cain Show. Should versus how it actually happens in people's minds. Because here's what's happening to Donald Trump. Case after case across America, across the docket. It was supposed to be that this Thursday, March 28th, Donald Trump would begin his quote-unquote hush money case in the Southern District of New York with prosecutor, federal prosecutor Alvin Bragg. That's been delayed because there is evidence that Alvin Bragg sitting on Hundreds of thousands of pages of discovery did not share them with Donald Trump's attorneys. Literally hundreds of thousands. And Trump's attorneys are making the claim they need more time, obviously, to go through all of this evidence. Discovery is the collection of evidence that will be used in a trial, and it has to be made available to both parties. But not unlike everything that takes place with Donald Trump, and maybe in all prosecutions, there's some dirty, dirty pool being played, you know? And... That case has been de delayed until at least mid-April. But the dirtiest of pool is the deadline today in New York Attorney General Letitia James's case for against Donald Trump for inflating real estate values in a victimless crime where the banks don't even want to seek resolution for $454 million today. Today, he needs to satisfy a bond. Now, how could that go down as we sit here today? Well, A, Donald Trump could come up with the cash. He has said he has the cash. His attorneys have said he done, doesn't have the cash. He said he wants to have that cash for his campaign. Now, which, by the way, I think gets to the heart of the matter, the heart of the truth. The whole point of these prosecutions, the whole point, is not justice. It's not even the outcome. It is the... It, it is the... Um, putting hurdles in the way of the re-election of Donald Trump for president. And that's what all of these cases represent. They don't represent handcuffs. They don't represent even, even the seizure of his properties. Here's why. It's very unlikely that would happen. That brings us to B. It's very unlikely that Trump Towers is taped off today or there's chains around one of his golf course, you know, entry doorways. Why? Because each of these properties probably have various stakeholders, you know, equity interest, lien holders, and that has to be litigated who's in line first, including the state of New York. So how does that play out? You know, over the it plays out in a courtroom over time. Trump, 
now is apparently a new multi-billionaire on top of whatever he had before because of the recent valuation of Truth Social. But that money can't really be marshaled to satisfy this bond who has a deadline, which has a deadline today. Because you, can, you can't immediately sell stock. You have to hold it for a certain period of time. And Donald Trump, despite having his net worth through the roof, that doesn't give him liquidity for the cash to satisfy this bond. So we'll see what happens today. But the point, getting back to this, is that justice isn't the point. The process is the point. The process is punishment. Being in the court, being tied up in a lawsuit, being subject to a criminal prosecution is punishment in and of itself. It wraps up your money. It puts your assets at potential uh, seizure, which is what we're looking at potentially today. It wraps up your time in being involved in half a dozen, dozen different court cases throughout the country in the pursuit of interrupting your race for the presidency. What you're looking at is lawfare is lawfare. What you're looking at is the point of the process. And that takes us back to the media's role in this. I want to share with you a little clip from MSNBC this weekend where they have apparently hired former RNC chairwoman Ronna McDaniel to be a contributor. But that didn't come without a big protest from Chuck Todd. I think our bosses owe you an apology for putting you in this situation because I don't know what to believe. She is now a paid contributor by NBC News. Well, I have no idea whether any answer she gave to you was because she didn't want to mess up her contract. Um, she wants us to believe that she was speaking for the RNC when the RNC was paying for her. So she has, she has credibility issues that she still has to deal with. Yeah. Is she speaking for herself or is she speaking on behalf of who's paying her? What a joke. Moral courage and a backbone because Ronna McDaniel's been hired to the network that employs Jen Psaki that I believe signed Jen Psaki to a contract while she was still working for the Biden administration, for a network that has political operatives from the Democratic Party across the board, including, including Chuck Todd, who's been a part of fundraisers for Hillary Clinton. What a joke. What a joke is the mainstream legacy media. Breaking news here. The judge in New York has reduced Donald Trump's Bond from $454 million down to $175 million. He has 10 days to pay the bond, now set at $175 million. If he pays, this will stop the clock on Letitia James, New York Attorney General's efforts to seize his assets while he appeals the judgment under Judge Ingeron. From $454 to $175, 10 days now to satisfy $175 million. Election 2024 in the courtroom. So let's begin the process of understanding the way people make decisions individually in a courtroom as society. Again, coming up in just a little bit, my buddy Dave Sugden, an expert trial attorney on what he's seen in jury boxes, in mock trial jury boxes, what he's seen from how people make decisions. But next, actor Clifton Duncan on one of the most fascinating figures of the 20th and 21st century. Thomas Sowell. That's next on The Will Cain Show. I'm Charles Payne. Listen to my Unstoppable Prosperity podcast so I can get you making money right now. 35 years on Wall Street taught me how to successfully invest in the stock market. In my four-part series, I'm going to teach you too. Some of Fox Business's finest join me to help tell my story, impart crucial lessons from my Unstoppable Prosperity book, and to give you the tools to achieve your own financial dreams. Listen anytime, everywhere at foxbusinesspodcast.com or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. It was the Hollywood murder trial that captivated America. Now, the Menendez brothers are back in the spotlight, and Fox Nation is bringing you a shocking docuseries with new evidence and new perspective on the case. There are real people at the heart of this story. Were abuse allegations overlooked? They couldn't imagine a father abusing his sons. Was their fate already sealed? I said, oh my God, this is rigged. And is there a case now to set the Menendez brothers free? The Menendez brothers, victims or villains, streaming now on Fox Nation. 
Well, they say there are certain things that shouldn't be brought up at the kitchen table, but not here at the Duffy's. So pull up a chair and join me, Rachel Campos Duffy. And me, former U.S. Congressman Sean Duffy, as we share our perspective on the discussions happening at kitchen tables across America. And we're going to share some real-life solutions as well to the everyday issues that you all talk about. And we're going to talk about some of those things that we agree on. And some that we don't. Download from the kitchen table, the Duffy's at foxnewspodcasts.com or wherever you download podcasts. Breaking news, Donald Trump's bond in New York lowered from $454 million to $175 million, a 61% decrease. He has 10 days to satisfy that bond in New York. We'll be talking to trial attorney Dave Sugden a little bit later here in the show. We'll talk about that decision in New York and all of the various cases against Donald Trump. Coming up on the Will Cain Show, streaming live at foxnews.com on the Fox News YouTube channel and the Fox News Facebook page. Hit subscribe at Apple, Spotify, or Fox News Podcast or on YouTube. It's in the description underneath this video. You can subscribe. Will Cain Show. He's an actor. He's a writer. He's performing in a one-man play about Thomas Sowell at soulplay.com. He's also the host of the Clifton Duncan podcast and writer at the State of the Arts on Substack. And he's on X at Clifton A. Duncan. Clifton, great to meet you. Great to have you on the Will Kane Show. Will, thanks for having me on. Not a lot, not a lot going on today, so uh, I, I, I'm happy that you were able to uh, slide me in. What do you think about it? I mean, you you actually have thoughts. I see your your ex profile. I seen you. I saw you recently tweet. I'm 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 so glad things have calmed down now that Donald Trump's not in office. <laughs> talking about it, the promises versus the reality of of a um, a public that voted out or that no longer embraced Donald Trump. Um, I'm curious what you think about it as we we're just we're we're wrapped up not so much in the way people might vote, but the way things will play out in a courtroom against Trump. Well, you know, I have to say that um, as an artist, I've removed myself a bit from politics and current events. But I, what I will say, uh, as someone who did not vote for Donald Trump, but who was in the entertainment industry when he was elected, I mean, you know, I, I've never seen uh, I've never seen adults lose their minds in, in, in quite that way. I've, I've never gotten past it. And I think one of the biggest things about Trump for me that's educational is that for, for, I mean, for one, there's so many things you can criticize about him. You don't have to make anything up, but they keep doing it anyway. Not that he does himself any favors, but on top of that, you know, it's the classic uh, tale of when you, you're trying to slay some monster, you become a monster yourself. And uh, I think he's served as a useful mirror for the ugliness and depravity on the other side. And, it's, uh, and we're still seeing that today and the corruption as well. What a fascinating, and I think a perspective that comes not 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 exclusively, but uniquely from from I think the mind of an artist. I mean, I, you know, I saw a tweet this weekend, um, Clifton. I can't remember who put this out, but it was about Keith Olbermann, the former ESPN and MSNBC host, and the way he <laughs> behaves on Twitter. And it was um, it was actually Jimmy Jimmy Dore, the comedian, who said, you know, Olbermann has turned in his mind Trump into this monster, but in order for him to reconcile who he is, he kind of becomes the same monster. And all the things he accuses Trump of doing and being and talking the way he does, he actually dealing with his shadow self, whatever's deep inside of him, actually ends up displaying as a way to reconcile with who he actually is, talking about Olbermann. Because he's completely crass and he's horrible on Twitter and calls people names and doesn't make logical arguments. He curses. And it's almost like he's becoming, he embodies who he projects onto Donald Trump. He's becoming what you said, that monster. And you're exactly right about society at large kind of becomes exactly what they feared about Donald Trump. Well, I think what you're also seeing play out is that um, I do think that people have a strong sense of fairness and justice. And I think that the more that the machine or the regime, whatever you want to call it, moves against Donald Trump, the more they look like bullies. And it's it's just so it's so strange. I mean, I, to me, Donald Trump is one of the most fascinating public figures um, that I've ever seen. And his ascension is yes. um, is really quite remarkable. It's like everything that should be wrong about him, everything that should hold him back seems to work in his favor somehow. And uh, it, it's just 
it's really fascinating to see that uh, as as horrible as we're told that he is, um, the people going after him seem to be, at least in the assessment of America right now, um, even worse than he is. And uh, so yeah. they, I, I just, I, I, I think the, I think pretty much the consensus now was that he's going to be reelected in November. And so, uh, you know, if we thought that 2020 or 2016 was a massive meltdown, I mean, I, I, I look forward in sort of a subversive way to see what happens in, uh, in this November, uh, because I just don't see uh, oh any gosh. other outcome at this point. I mean, uh, the biggest public freak out you've ever seen, but then the part that really scares me, the, the whole marshalization of the, the entity that is Washington, D.C., um, marshaled against Donald Trump in a way that I think we haven't even yet seen in, in 2020, if he were elected in, in 2024. One more on this, because I agree with you. I think Donald Trump, I, I, people will hear this and they'll think, oh, you know, I'm waving a pom-pom. I'm, I'm not. I think he might be the most fascinating person of the last century. And, and, and the reason for that is because of how he affects everyone else. Like, he is the ultimate Rorschach test. And, and, and I mean, I think books and books and books should be written on his rhetorical style, his persuasion ap appeal, his, but also how he inspires hatred. And it's like this mass psychological um, moment. Like, the whole nation's been put on the couch. And we're all, like, letting out our deep thoughts or something and letting out who we really are devoid of all the niceties that were there before. So I don't know, but I just think whatever, the way we've reacted is what makes him, we as a public, was what makes him so fascinating. And and you coming from the world of art, like I probably, I can't think of a world, actually journalism may be close, where, where you would have seen it like at its most acute point. Like everybody that you're friends with or work with probably embodied the height of this like, um, emotional reaction to Donald Trump. Well, it was funny because the I was doing a show in Hartford, Connecticut in, uh, in 2016 around the time of the election, and nothing better symbolizes the disconnect between the general public and what the arts world was thinking at that time. Um, the first person who ever told me that he was voting for Trump was our barber. We were working on this show, and it was our black barber who was a, a, a multiple small business owner. And um, and he and his black friend, as a matter of fact, were telling me they was like, yeah, dog, Trump gonna make it so we can get some money. And it wasn't some knee jerk, um, uninformed decision. He was talking about how under the Obama administration, he had difficulty as a small business owner and entrepreneur um, with the regulations that Obama had placed in the way, which is a complaint I'd heard uh, multiple times. So his his concerns were purely economic. And then I would go over to the YMCA and the white guys over there were also talking about the election. And what they were talking about was jobs and taxes. So again, there's these economic concerns that were going on that transcend race. But then I would go into rehearsal and it was like, man, if you voted for Trump, you can unfriend me now. Man, racist this, racist that. White supremacy this, white supremacy that. So, so right away, I said to myself, this is completely, uh, they're completely off because MSNBC is telling them one thing about what it really is about. And then the actual people you know, regular working class or maybe upper class people, upper middle class people are saying, well, look at his policies on on jobs and taxes and business regulations. And that's what they were looking at. And um, mm -hmm. so uh, already I had a I had a very broad sense that um, there was a huge disconnect between the arts and entertainment sector and the general public as far as um, th their feelings about Trump. So we'll come back to Donald Trump here in a little bit here on the Will Cain Show. We're going to talk about the mechanics of the new $175 million judgment uh, lowered from 454 uh, as of in the past half hour here. We'll talk about that coming up on the Will Cain Show with what I think is one of America's best trial attorneys, Dave Sugden, here on the Will Cain Show. But to continue with Cl um, Clifton uh, Duncan here. Um, so you've got a one-man play coming out against uh, about one, and you've crowdfunded this thing, which is incredible. I think one of the most, if it's not Donald Trump, which we just nominate him for one of the most fascinating people of the last hundred years, I, I definitely think while he flies under the popular culture radar, he is one of the most fascinating men of the last hundred years, and that's Thomas Sowell. So why? How'd you get inspired by it, and how'd you want to focus on Thomas Sowell? 
Well, um, you know, a few years ago, I saw this wonderful one-man show off-Broadway called Satchmo at the Waldorf, and this wonderful actor named John Douglas Thompson embodied. It was a one. It was a one-man show about uh, Louis Armstrong, and throughout the course of the show, you see this actor not only embody Louis Armstrong but also Miles Davis as well as Armstrong's white manager. A few years before that, you can still watch this particular show on Amazon Prime. But uh, the uh, but Lawrence Fishburne did a play called Thurgood, which is about Thurgood Marshall, and uh, it was filmed for HBO. It's pretty pretty uh, um, successful production. Um, years before that, the great James Earl Jones did a one-man play about Paul Robeson. And so I was thinking to myself, and it's, it's an idea that's been in my head for a few years, you know, who would be what, what, who would be the subject of a great uh, one-man play that I could write and create and perform myself? And, um, you know, and Thomas Sowell had already been on my radar for a few years. And I said, well, it seems like a, a, a no-brainer to me. I have to write a show about this person who, who I think is very fascinating and who, frankly, would not get this the same kind of treatment in our regular um, mainstream yeah. cultural institutions. So it just sort of it it, it came from there, and uh, then I was uh, urged to share my idea with people. And uh, you know, the the success of the crowdfunding campaign is something I, I could ever have imagined. It's really unbelievable. It's sitting at one hundred and forty thousand right now, as a matter of fact. On Indiegogo, that is awesome. Um, yeah. By the way, anybody watching, if you want to contribute, so first of all, Clifton's doing this play, which I think he he wants to workshop it across the country and then release it on streaming later. Um, this needs to be made. Like I think this needs to be made. So let so for a moment, if anyone listening or watching isn't familiar with Thomas Sowell, just I think go to YouTube and look up clips of Thomas Sowell, and then you're going to want to buy his books. And he's he's a legit genius. Like, and you know what's interesting? He's he, I think he would call himself conservative. He's black. Um, you know what's interesting about Thomas Sowell, Clifton, is that there's other, there's other, like, first of all, let's forget whether or not you're conservative or not. Guys like Thomas Sowell and Clarence Thomas are interesting in and of themselves because they are different, right? Because they're individuals. And I think that nominates you on its own to be the subject of art and exploration. Like, why do you think the way you think? What was your life like? Um, what led you to this place where, look, 90% of uh, blacks vote uh, Democrat, um, at least it was been that case in the past. We'll see what it is in 2024. But, um, you know, guys like Soul and, and, and Clarence Thomas, they're zigging to the zag when it comes to intellectual thought. And that in and of itself, agreement or disagreement is interesting. And art should be the subject of something that's interesting, you know. And what I was thinking about is that's made Clarence Thomas, although he's more high profile, really a target you know he's called an uncle tom he's called this or that they don't do people don't do that with thomas soul i don't know maybe they're afraid you know like because if you're ever watching these tv clips don't mess with thomas soul like he is never at a loss for an intellectual argument it's like he's considered everything i'm just i kind of find it fascinating there's not this big anti-thomas soul um i don't know group out there attacking him well, I think uh, I forgot who it was. It might have been uh, Steven Pinker who said that at a certain point, people just had to start ignoring him because uh, he he's so effective in terms of clinically uh, taking apart um, a lot of left wing talking points. I mean, I, I think what's the interesting thing about uh, men like Soul and Clarence Thomas and uh, the late uh, Walter E. Williams, The Economist, um, any black yeah. person faces immense, immense uh, social pressure to conform to one particular ideology. And I'm reading Soul's memoirs right now. This is a man who, uh, as a child, faced discrimination. He, he grew up during the days of Jim Crow. And um, and he was not immune, Soul was not immune to these ideas about black and white and uh, this sort of um, left-wing, dare I say, Marxist worldview that's been pumped into generations of impressionable black minds. Um, so to go against that in and of itself and to reject that social pressure is an immense act of courage for any black person because everywhere you turn, um, whether you're, I mean, you can't even watch ESPN these days without getting some of this, um, these racial, cultural, Marxist sort of um, um, talking points. You can't escape it. But the music we listen to, the the celebrities that we enjoy, the the news that we consume, the algorithms that we uh, that we uh, employ, um, they all kind of steer you toward one method of thinking. And one of the things I think that attracted me to Soul is that he, like I, 
um, as, as I did myself, was think, spent his life thinking one way, and then he had to shift his thinking another way. And so that to me makes him a compelling figure, A, not only to have the intelligence to be able to shift uh, and, and, and change your mind, but also the courage to do so. And, uh, and on top of that, the courage to just be unapologetic about this is what I think, this is how I came to these conclusions. Here is my evidence. Here are the facts. Mm. Here's the data that I used to reach these uh, conclusions. And um, that to me is a really compelling aspect of his character. Oh, he makes rock solid arguments. That's the thing. Impenetrable, like you said. And so the result is you just have to start, the, the opposition has to start ignoring him because it can't defeat what he has to say. Um, I, I think I have my history correct. Soul was on the left. That's what you're referencing, right? Early in his life. And then you said that you were as well. I, I'm curious about you. When and how did you make that change? And I'm not presuming, by the way, I don't know your politics, Clifton, but even your interest in Thomas Soul and your appreciation of him suggests you're not at least wholeheartedly on the left anymore. So I'm curious where that change, how that change might have occurred for you. Um, well, it's sort of a long process. I'll truncate it a little bit. Um, I mean, I, I still describe myself as pretty fairly liberal, but it depends on what uh, what topics you're talking about. And uh, so if I, for instance, were talking about, um, I think conservatives have a great have a great point when they talk about, say, the strength of the family and family values. But you never see me preach about that because I'm a libertine. So I can't. <laughs> so I would be a total hypocrite if I were to say, hey, you know, you all should be getting married. I mean, I think that if you're going to get married, you should live, you know, you should honor that marriage. Um, but, you know, as, as an artist, I don't think it really behooves me to wholly embrace conservatism. But at the same time, um, I distinguish leftism from liberalism. And I think leftism is a destructive, cynical, nihilistic force that is anti-art, anti-life, and anti-society. So I, as an artist, I can't embrace that either. Um, but for me, you know, I wasn't always like this. I was a default uh, liberal. And like I said, especially as a black person, you grow up with these mindsets, sort of this mindset pumped into your head. And, you know, you're, you're a child, so you don't really know anything else. But around 2014 is where a, re a really big shift happened. But it was on top of these other shifts that had taken place. One, um, I decided around 2008 that, um, you know, whether you're talking about some right wing Nazi or some far left pasty white progressive, um, if you can't see me as a human being before my demographic, i.e. a black male, then I have no mm -hmm. I have no interest in having any kind of relationship with you. I'm a human being before I'm a black, before I'm black, before I'm male, I'm a human being first and foremost. So that was a big shift for me. The second shift came a couple of years later when I basically decided to stop apologizing for being a man. The entertainment industry right now is a very, very caustic environment um, against males, against masculinity, and against male achievement. And um, I internalized all of that, especially, again, we're talking about Black America. It's a very, very, um, the term is, is gynocentric. Uh, they sort of uphold our Black queens to the detriment, I think, of our men. And there's this idea that, um, you know, men are better, uh, excuse me, women are better than men, and yada, 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 you're, you're a male, you're toxic, you're trash, this, that, and the fourth. Um, once I began to reject that, that was another major shift for me. So now I'm, I'm in an industry now where uh, racial politics and sex and gender politics have, you know, are heating up. And I have, uh, I have self-affirming views which run counter to that. But then 2014 happened. Mm. And there was a huge kerfuffle called Gamergate, which uh, the sequel is unfolding right now, as a matter of fact. And it's way too complicated to get into. But I basically saw... Um, the machine for what it is. I saw what was actually happening and I saw how it was being reported on. I saw how progressives, quote unquote progressives, shut down conversation. I saw how quote unquote progressives uh, either ignore or denigrate minorities and sexual minorities, racial minorities and women who do not go along with their program. Um, I just, I saw the corruption, the lies, the, just the blatant lying for what it was. At the same time, all the Michael Brown stuff was happening. Uh, hands up, don't shoot. And the Washington Post of all outlets had extraordinary reporting where they even had diagrams from the uh, autopsy by the medical examiner hired by the Brown family. There was no way that the story we were being told about hands up, don't shoot could be true, not based on the forensic evidence, not right. based on the physical evidence, nothing. Everything supported Officer Darren Wilson's uh, version of events. However, we're being told by celebrities, by politicians, by everybody, these pundits, um, the same the same story. I said these people are lying. They're straight up lying. They're lying. They're lying. 
Um, they're either ignorant or lying. And I also went to the BLM website at that time as well. And I said, these people don't care about black people at all. They don't care about black people. They think that they're- You're, uh, you're, yeah. you're aware this has all made you a racist. Well, you know, it's it's just, it's again, it's left-wing ideology coming back at you whenever you say these things. Because, yeah. you know, for instance, I go to the BLM website and people thought that they were protesting against excessive police brutality. But when you, when you went to the page, it was a bunch of intersectional um, queer gender theory buzzwords, which, you know, black people are more socially conservative than Democrats seem to be aware of. And they're not really about this stuff, but they specifically skipped over um, protecting or supporting fathers in that website. There was a section that said, you know, we mm -hmm. support mothers, parents, guardians, caregivers. Somebody wrote that section and deliberately left out the word father. And that's when I said, these people do not care about what really ails the black community. And um, so all these things happen all at Which once. Which is what? And that was, say what? Which is what? Uh, what which, really what ails what? the black community? You're alluding to fatherhood. Um, well, it's just this, the disintegration of the family, um, the denigration of uh, yeah. these, these strong families. And, you know, we talk about these deadbeat males, but we never talk about um, you know, mate selection. Why are these males being chosen um, in the first place mm. uh, to be fathers? But you can't talk about those th ty types of things. But on the ground, people know what the issues are. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's just it's a very it's a very weird thing. But when you see this organization, um, which is a piece or a subsidiary of a larger political ideology, which runs so counter to what the true needs are of the people. Um, you know, once you see all these things at the same time, there's no way that you can honestly say, I'm still, I'm still aligned with these people. On top of all of that, I realized in 2016 that if you're a happy, self-actualized and self-possessed black person, the Democrats have no use for you. In fact, they despise you. And that was a big, uh, a major break for me. What I love about your story, though, is while it's individual, while it's, you, it's your path, I don't think it's necessarily one that you've blazed alone. I think it's I think it's something that a lot of people experienced. Every way you walked me through that, from the rejection of identity politics and the requirement that you accept me as an individual, from the requirement that you see me as a man, that men should not be denigrated, from the lying on individual cases, that if you pointed to the truth on any number of these cases, and, and Michael Brown was one, but it, it followed with a whole host of cases in the ensuing years, if you cared about the facts, you were called a racist. That's why I made that joke, you know, you know now you're a racist, Clifton. Um, the, all of that, I think, is a path that has affected many, many people over the past decade. And it doesn't end up in you having to say, now I'm on the right, or now I'm Republican, or now I'm conservative. You're still capable of your own individual thought as we all are, right? But it also lets you just see, see the original Cracker Jack box formula you were handed as a child, like you said, that now you've learned how to reject. Uh, I want to I want to go here in the end, though. You have done Broadway, Shakespeare, NCIS. You're in the acting community. So now you've made this this you know, transformation personally and then professionally, you're embracing a guy like Thomas Sowell. What's been the reaction of your community? Well, you know, I would say that I'm no longer in the acting community. I don't consider myself of the acting community um, because for those who aren't aware, um, I was one of the few entertainment professionals who in 2021, when all of the uh, COVID mandates came down, I said, I'm not you know, I'd already have this disease. Like, why should I be taking this injection for something I've already gotten? So I, I, there's a term I use for it, but I won't use it for your viewers. Uh, it starts with the word N. Um, I, but uh, I got purged from the industry because of my stances on the, on the pandemic, which I was right about, by the way. Um, so I still have spies on the inside. And, uh, and it's interesting because, for one, the theater as a whole right now is failing. Broadway reached record highs, uh, record box office numbers in the 2018-2019 season. They have not repeated. They, they, they just they have not gone back to those numbers. The theater industry, about 20 to 30 percent of the audience has not returned post-pandemic. Um, there were experts predicting that by uh, a, a month, months from now, the industry will have contracted by about 50 percent. My friends tell me that um, they're having much more trouble finding work now than they than they did before the pandemic. There's, there's fewer jobs out there. Same thing happening in Hollywood. So these industries mm -hmm. now um, have contracted themselves. But what's funny now is that even though I got, I, I feel like I got pushed out and blacklisted, um, now all these broke unemployed actors are looking at me 
um, who just made $140,000, um, which is more than most of these people will make over the, the span of the year or next five years. And um, oh. they're, they're presiding in industries which are losing relevance and, um, and losing their stature and their structure and their, their power. And uh, I think the, the new way to go is to forge your own path and to leave these failing institutions behind because they're, they're poorly managed, they're dysfunctional, they're run by people who have no clue what they're really doing. And they just told the American people that they're not essential for two straight years. And they're, now they're shocked that Americans happen to agree with them. And yet now I propose this idea to say, hey, let me write this play about this person. And um, over 900 people said, you know what? This is a great idea. I'm gonna support this. So it's not that Americans are not interested in the arts. It's not that they're not interested in seeing culture created. It's just that they're not interested in whatever the mainstream institutions are putting out right now. And as far as the acting community goes, you know, these are people who said that they didn't even want to have um, unvaccinated people in their audiences. And they call yeah. people like me plague rats and and uh, and granny killers. Um, so, you know, there's there's a handful of people that are like me and went through the same experience. And each of us is of the same mindset. We have no no desire to ever include ourselves among these particular people, AKA the acting community ever again. Um, the good news is that there's Avengers assembling now outside of that arena who are very, very high caliber, um, you know, ex Broadway, ex uh, Hollywood talent who are coming yeah. together now and saying, there's a problem. We see what the problems are and uh, we need to create something that's outside this system. And um, the response I've gotten from many people in the acting community is they're, they're looking up to people like me because they, they, they believe I'm showing them a new way forward, which, um, you know, I never asked for any of this, but, you know, I'll take it for now. We'll make it 901. I can't wait to see Soul or your play on uh, Thomas Soul. Um, I'd love you to come back once you have it produced and ready to go. I'd love to be in the audience. I'd love to help people stream it. Um, and I'd love to have you back on the Will Kane show. If nothing else, I want to follow up on the black community being gynocentric. What a fascinating thing you said that I did not escape my attention, but I don't have the time today to fully explore. So I, I hope I hope you uh, will come back here and we can have further discussions on the Will Kane show. Thank you, Clifton. Oh. Of course, Will. Thanks for having me. You can go to soulplay.com if you want to donate. Soulplay.com. There you go. Crowdfunded Indiegogo, soulplay.com. Thanks to Clifton Duncan. All right, let's return to Donald Trump and the breaking news today that his bond in New York has been lowered from $454 million to $175 million. What does that mean? What are the actual mechanics that will take place in the next 10 days? And what actually happens inside a jury box with one of my lifelong friends? I think one of the best trial attorneys in America, Dave Sugden, next on The Will Cain Show. Stay on top of the latest forecast with America's weather team in the palm of your hands. Here's the latest from America's Weather Center. It's Fox weather updates throughout your busy day, every day. Five inches of rain by tomorrow. Temperatures being 30 degrees above average. Put the power of over 100 meteorologists and the worldwide resources of Fox in your hands with the Fox Weather Podcast. Precise, personal, powerful. Subscribe and listen now at foxnewspodcasts.com. Did you hear the news? Now you can with instant updates from Fox News for Amazon Alexa. Breaking stories and top headlines, the economy, and so much more. Brought to you by Fox News, America's number one cable news network. Plus, setup couldn't be easier because everything's ready to go in the app. Just say, Alexa, play news from Fox. In Fox News. It's the latest when you need it. On demand from Fox News and Amazon Alexa. From the Fox News Podcasts Network. Hey, this is Trey Gowdy, host of the Trey Gowdy Podcast. Every Tuesday, you'll hear what's on my mind. Plus, every Thursday, there's a special bonus episode where we answer the questions that are on your mind. Make sure to spend your Tuesdays and Thursdays with Trey. Subscribe now at foxnewspodcast.com or wherever you download podcasts. Hope to see you. America's listening to Fox News. Donald Trump has pulled in to 40 Wall Street, one of his properties in New York, and he's expected to address the public, address the media here 
shortly. We'll keep you up to date on what Donald Trump has to say about the breaking news that his bond in New York has been lowered from $454 million to $175 million, something he will have to satisfy within the next 10 days. It's the Will Cain Show, streaming live at foxnews.com, the Fox News YouTube channel, the Fox News Facebook page. Hit subscribe at Apple or Spotify or right here on YouTube. It's underneath the description, a little convenient button. You can hit subscribe to the Will Cain Show. Uh, Dave Sugden is a lifelong friend of mine. He's a business trial attorney at um, he's a business trial attorney at Dave. Hold on, man. I, I've got the, the firm. I only think of you. Call and Jenkins. Call and Jenkins. Call Dave. and Jensen. Jensen. Look at you. You got a whole suit on. Oh, my gosh. Super professional. <laughs> I've known Dave my entire life or not my entire life since college. He played baseball at Pepperdine. He's one of my good friends. Um, we get together for breakfast every once in a while, and when we do, I say, ah, man, why don't you come on my show? We should have some of these same conversations. And I mean it when I say this. Dave is like, in my estimation, pioneered a unique career that all of us wanted to have whoever went to law school. You know, we grew up with either dads that were trial lawyers. We watched, we're all too young to watch Perry Mason, but we all watched drama about the courtroom. We wanted to be in the courtroom. And very few lawyers are actually in the courtroom. And Dave is on a continuous basis. He literally tries cases, takes them up late in the stage of litigation, and he's in the courtroom. And so, Dave and I, what we end up talking about all the time is, you know, the nature of cross-examination, the way juries think, the way people think, and his window into how people think based upon seeing them make decisions in a courtroom. So when I say I think he's one of America's best trial lawyers, it's not just because I've known him for 20 some odd years because I, I really mean that and I've had the opportunity to hear his thoughts over steak and eggs. So, uh, Dave, first of all, awesome to have finally done this. Yeah. Um, tell me what your thoughts are on this news. First of all, that Donald Trump had a $454 million bond today that's now been lowered to $175 million. Yes. Well, what we're, what we're seeing in this bond issue is sort of a continuation of what seems like almost an upside down case. And when you look at the theory of Letitia James and her team, and now you look at the bond issue, what you're seeing is in terms of her theory of the case, the idea was Trump isn't as wealthy as he says he is. He should not be allowed to deal with banks. He should not be allowed to engage in any more real estate transactions at all. She sought a lifetime ban. And then when you look at the briefing as to why he should get a, bank, uh, get a bond, what she says is he can go to a bank, he can get a loan, he can sell his properties. And so she's saying, in essence, our lawsuit was designed to stop what we're saying he should do now. And so now we have the Court of Appeals saying we're going to reduce it, which doesn't, I don't think, change much for 10 days, other than it's probably more easy for Trump and his team to get a bond. And so, the, and by the way, and just to revisit the facts of the case, the, the allegations are that Donald Trump inappropriately inflated the value of his various real estate properties in order to negotiate a more favorable loan to a bank. Now, every real estate friend I've said says, so does everybody. Like, that's the normal course of business. Like, get the highest valuation you can in front of a bank for your existing properties to increase the value or the ability of you to get the loan you desire. But then there's the bank on the other side, and they go, no, we don't think it's worth that. We don't think it's worth X. We think it's worth Y. They do their own due diligence. It's a negotiation, which happened in this case, and none of the banks feel like victims. But so Letitia James takes a normal business practice of the negotiation of value of an asset and turns it into a crime. Well, it, it's so strange because when you, when you think of the priorities of a state attorney general, Protecting banks and insurance companies is usually not high on the priority list. In other words, they're designed to protect consumers, protect the public. And it's not as though these banks are super unsophisticated when it comes to giving out nine-figure loans. They do their due diligence. And so it's a bit of a head-scratcher when you see a state attorney general say, I'm, I'm going to go after this private transaction and seek a civil, the equivalent of a civil conviction. And um, you think the it being reduced to $175 million, he has 10 days. I, the thing is, none of us know what his you know, real asset sheet looks like, how liquid he is. We don't know any of that. So like you said, the, the only real takeaway from this at this point is, well, it's a lower number, so it's easier for him to satisfy that judgment. Do you think anything else would happen in the next 10 days legally to affect his necessity to pay $175 million? 
I don't anticipate much will happen legally in the next 10 days. I mean, the briefing is essentially done. I imagine they may file some additional briefs asking again, but I imagine that now that the Court of Appeal has spoken, this is the number, this is the deadline. The question becomes, if he doesn't post a bond by that date, what happens next? Right. And the same question we were asking today when the number was $454 million. All right. I want to I wanna ask you, um, I, I just want to bring the audience into some of our conversations. And it's always hard to recreate a conversation. But it was last week we were having breakfast, um, and you were telling me about one of the things you guys do to prepare for trial is you do mock trials, and you impanel mock juries. And we were talking about um, the way it goes down in a jury room after the case is over. Um and how a jury makes up his mind. And it, I, it just blew my mind, but it also didn't make me think about us as individuals and us as a society. So just like share with us that story you were talking about of how quickly a jury comes to a conclusion. Sure. So, so what we'll do is that we will do a, a sort of a mock jury exercise. And what we do is we present the case, a case that we're going to have and we're going to try it in the future. What we want to do is see what is a jury going to do with our case. And so what we will do is we will get, it's essentially a focus group where we'll get anywhere from 24 to 30 people and we'll give a presentation, a plaintiff presentation, a defense presentation and a rebuttal by the plaintiff. And each individual will have an iPad and he or she will sort of give their thoughts on the case and they will render their verdict individually. And then what happens next is you divide the group into two rooms and then with a two-way mirror, we're able to essentially review and watch how the deliberations go down. And what I was sharing with you, Will, it's fascinating. The way it's not really a deliberation, but rather what you see is the strong personalities sort of dictate what's going to happen. And so it's not uncommon. We've had this recently where in room number one, we have a defense verdict. In room number two, we have a plaintiff verdict and it's multi-millions in terms of what the verdict is. And these two groups saw the same thing, saw the exact same thing. And so what you see is how that decision gets made. And what you often see is as the dialogue begins, the strong personalities, the leaders in the room sort of emerge and then as a result, people sort of follow along and they want to sort of fit in and they want to have connection. And so in room number one, you have someone that says, oh, I think it's I think it's a defense verdict. And here's why I think it's a def defense verdict. What do you think? And all of a sudden, people start sort of gravitating towards that verdict. And in the other room, you see the absolute opposite take place. And it, it's not unlike your prior guest, Clifton Duncan, where he talks about how because he was sort of thinking a different way on certain issues, he sort of feels excluded. And what you see in these deliberations is the fear of exclusion, where someone has said, I think this, here's why. And once people start sensing there's agreement, consensus happens pretty fast. You, you told me like in five minutes, like you told me a story of one of those rooms, the first person to speak was sort of, I hope I'm not divulging anything you didn't want me to tell you, but like, you know, kind of purple haired, nose ring. And you told me that her major desire when she was speaking was to not be speaking, that she did not want to go first. She didn't want to stake a position. And then the second speaker was a strong personality guy. And you said to yourself, literally five minutes into deliberation, you turn to your, your friends or colleagues, you're like, game, set, match. It's over. Right. Second dude spoke and everyone will go that way. Yes, yes. And so what we saw is sort of a, a personality where this person was asked to go first and you could tell there was profound discomfort. This person did not want to sort of stake her position. And so she sort of gave a waffly answer. On the one hand, this. On the other hand, that. What do you think? And so she sort of not wanting to take a position, again, for, in a cynical way, fear of reje rejection, in a less cynical way, desire for human connection. And so then what happens is you see the individual who's much stronger, who says, I feel strongly this way, this is why I think that, and then all of a sudden I sort of joked and said, game, set, match. And what you're going to see is most of the folks sort of following along. And then what happens is that each room continues the discussion and what they're doing is they're not looking to poke holes or weaknesses in their in their deliberation but rather what they're sharing are things that now confirm what they believe to be true and so when you watch each room if you were just an observer who hadn't watched the presentations you would think 
this is, you would have thought these are totally different cases because in room one, they've got a memory that confirms the bias of their defense verdict. On the other hand, in another room, they're saying, oh, this is clearly a strong case for the plaintiff and here's why. And I asked you in all your years of doing this, and I'm going to get to why this is important in a minute. Like, I, I'm fascinated by this, yeah, because I'm, you know, I'm interested in rhetoric and logic and persuasion. I'm interested in in the law and trials, but also I, I actually think this is what, what we're talking about is not just a focus group for a trial, but a focus group for all of us as society and how we coalesce and how we make decisions. So, and then I think you could even apply it individually to how we interact individually with one another. Like Dave and I have talked about how you persuade your kids based upon understanding what people do here. Like, so it, I, I just think it's applicable in any walk of life. And I asked you in all your years, you're doing this. Have you ever seen a 12 angry men situation where it's like 11 people ready to go and one holdout? And your answer was never, <laughs> never. It, it, it doesn't happen, at least not in these focus groups. It just does. It just does not. And it's not to say there's, there couldn't be a situation where someone is sort of you know, an independent thinker and truly wants to not fit in. I don't want to be overly cynical, but what you do see is the strong pull of people wanting to connect, wanting to share things in common. And what you see is a lot of following. It just sort of inevitably happens. And and what we, you and I talked about, Will, is also the, the idea of how do people come to decisions? And you know, Will, you went to law school, so did I, and we spent three years sort of learning how to think with our minds. In other words, how to think logically. And we sort of exit law school thinking, well, I now know how to argue logically. That means I must now, I must now be persuasive. And I'll try to persuade through logic. And what my experience has been, and I think we see this in politics everywhere, is that people make decisions first off how they feel. There's sort of a gut reaction to something they hear, something they feel. And then after that, they sort of use their mind to rationalize their decision, rationalize what they're feeling. And so people aren't consciously in a deliberation saying, I want to fit in, therefore I will follow this person. But rather, there's sort of this idea of what do I feel? How do I feel about this argument? And then to sort of reconcile that, they'll use their mind to explain how they got there. And so oftentimes after a trial, we will talk to jurors afterwards and what we will get is really good explanations that sound logical and sound all, you know, sound, they follow the evidence, they follow the law and, and they explain how they got there. But the, the real question is, how did they first decide in their gut which way they are going? How did they feel? Because a lot of times that can trigger how they're going to rationalize their ultimate decision. So you're exactly right. And in that, you know, for most of my career, and for anyone watching, like, I think the hard thing to do is to separate the world and the way it is from the way that you think the world should be. And you're right, for a lot of us that come out of law school, and certainly for me, I think the world should operate by reason and logic. But that can't push me into a situation of thinking that's the way the world does work, um, just because I think it should work that way. And and so, you know, I've become much more humble in, in I know that sounds ridiculous, but that I've become much more humble in making arguments and understanding, like I told you, Dave, when I was at CNN as a contributor, and even in my early days at ESPN, I was just a jackhammer for logic. Like, I mean, it's just like, you're wrong, boom, 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 here's why. And I think I just come become more humble on the limitations of that as a tool of persuasion. It doesn't make you wrong, but you also aren't as effective in convincing people you are right. And so it, what what I'm getting at, and I, I'm, I'm pretty honest with my audience, like I don't do things in a calculated nature, or at least not consciously. I don't know about subconsciously, but I don't sit there and go, how can I make this argument most persuasive? I just kind of do what comes naturally. You have to think that way a little more because your job is more overtly to persuade 12 people. How do you use that, Dave? Or even you and I talk about our personal lives. We talk about our families, you know, and wives and children, anyone listening, like bosses. Like, I don't even know if you're trying to actually use this information and use this. I, I don't even know how you begin to say, all right, well, if it's not logic, which you, one can understand, and now I have to understand the way people feel at all times and how logic fits into how they feel. I don't know how you turn that into, and it sounds cynical to say a tool, but in, yeah, into a tool for persuasion. 
Well, I, I think it's, it's a matter of sort of understanding human nature. In other words, we, we can, as, as lawyers, think, hey, here's why I'm logically right. Here, here's why the facts and the law match, and here's why I'm going to win. But, but the reality is, is that the decision maker, whether it's a jury, your boss, your spouse, they have to want to have a reason to find in your favor. And so a lot of times you have to, as a lawyer, think of, okay, I understand what the facts are, but what's the story that I can tell? That's always true, that, that aligns with the evidence. But when I tell this story, it's going to make the jurors feel a certain way where they want my side to win. A lot of times in these civil cases, there aren't that many facts in dispute, but what you do see is sort of the competition of ideas where the plaintiff will have one certain narrative. In other words, once upon a time, there was this plaintiff who, until the defendant did this bad thing, this happened, and now you as the jury can fix all of that. Now, if the defendant gets up there and says, well, there's no causation. In fact, what you're going to see is that there may have been a number of different causes as to why this person's injured or whatever. What you have is a narrative by the plaintiff that tells a story. And the jury's gonna hear that and think, I, I feel something. I, I'm very sympathetic to what happened to this plaintiff. Meanwhile, this defendant has sort of a technical argument that's just not gonna stick. It's sort of like your CNN days. In other words, if a person wants to, say, wants to think something, and you're going with logic, they're not going to, you're not going to sway them away. Whereas if a defendant has an alternative narrative, this is what the case is about. This is about a plaintiff that could have been more responsible or whatever. You're at least providing competing stories so that you can get to the sort of gut and hearts of the jurors so that you've at least given them a chance to feel a certain way. And then they're more likely to listen to your logical arguments. If you lead with logic, you're, you're, they, they won't be listening at all. There's some um, like ancient metaphor about that, like it's easier to steer an elephant by the nose than it is by the head, or something <laughs> like that. Um, that's that has to do with you know reason versus emotion. Um, I don't know, man. I love I love every conversation we have. You know that. I, I th at some point, I want to share it with the audience as well. And um, I just think there's so much to learn about about the way we as individuals make decisions. As you said, the, the desire to fit in, I've come to believe that fear is the biggest motivator. And I guess that's a fear of ostracization that people are fighting. Um, they just, they want to be accepted in part of the group. But then it's also just like, I don't know, politics, life, how you, how you communicate, like yeah. how we communicate with one another and try to convince each other of, of objective truth. Um, all right. Call Jensen is his firm. Dave Sugden. Business trial lawyer, one of the best. By the way, he educates lawyers at evidenceattrial.com. Um, I'll meet you for breakfast, and let's do this again on the Will Cain Show, man. Love it. Thank, Thank you, you, buddy. Stay well. All right. There he is, Dave Sugden. All right, there you have, I think, um, both the breaking news, the technical um, aspects of what happened with the deadline for the bond for Donald Trump today being lowered from $454 million to $175 million, but also I think the deeper thematic takeaways as I want to do on how we um, coalesce the wisdom and the folly of crowds and how we make decisions as individuals here today on the Will Cain Show. All right, that's going to do it for me today. Hit subscribe, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and I'll see you again next time.